here. So, Shrof, what, uh, so what is the theme for this year is, what is the reason for preventing a stroke? So, very, it's asking you a question actually. So, the real answer is, as we know, it is going to be the second leading cause of death in the next analysis. So, and we have a huge disability burden because of the stroke. And India is slowly heading towards that diabetes, the stroke capital of the world. Because we are, every year we are seeing more and more young strokes, that is below 45. We see around 25% of the strokes are below, affecting below 45. So, you, slowly because of the other secondary risk factors, we are becoming the stroke capital of the world. So, definitely it's our responsibility as a medical professional to give awareness to the public, the society, what are the implications of stroke, how to treat and how to deal with it. So I will briefly go through that. In India, every year, every day around 4,000 strokes happen. So approximately 200 to 300 strokes will be happening in a metro like Chennai every day. So this is a worldwide campaign going for the last 25 years. How to recognize a stroke if it happens for, in our surroundings. So FASD, we have to act fast. That is the theme. So F stands for, as we all know, any deviation, acute deviation of the face, any difficulty in lifting the arm, any disturbance in speech, not able to understand or pronounce words or slurring of speech, then we have to act very fast. So this is the theme, we have to again propagate this. So just going back to the physiology, we have three types of stroke which can happen. Most commonly 85% happens due to blockage of the blood flow to the brain. The other 15% happens due to bleeding inside the brain or bleeding in the covering of the brain. So this is called subtractal hemorrhage. And the other one, the intraparenchymal bleed, most commonly is due to very uncontrolled high BP. So these are the CT scans. We'll be familiar, this is an acute ischemic stroke. This is a, usually again the basal ganglia bleed due to high, high BP. And this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, most commonly due to a ruptured annulus. So the risk factors, these are also very familiar. We know stroke share the same risk factors with the ischemic heart disease. And apart from that, if the patient has a heart disease, particularly valvular or non-valvular atrial fibrillation, they have a very high risk of stroke. So what happens basically? Stroke, the brain is a secondary, it, it gets, it's, a, it's an innocent bystander. The pathology happens in the arteries going to the brain or in the heart. From there, the clot travels to the brain and causes an occlusion of the arteries. And in, in turn, it gets the impact. So, there is around 30 percent of the stroke which was considered to be idiopathic or unknown or cryptogenic. But we are slowly understanding this. There are some indigenous risk factors why for India, high triglyceride is a common risk, very high triglyceride level is a stroke. One of the causes now we are understanding. Vasculitis is a very common cause, like patient having an SLE or a rheumatoid causes. They are, so, these cryptogenic percentages slowly getting lesser. So we are, are having more understanding of this entity. So basically, not like heart. Heart is a basically a mechanical pump. Brain is a very unique organ where different parts of the brain have different functions. <coughs> suppose this area is affected, we lose the function of the hand. If suppose this area is affected, the broadcast area, we can't express our word. If this area is affected, we can't understand the language. So. Stroke has multiple implications, multiple symptoms. But so if you see, even the right side and the left side has a different function, and the right side has a different function. Apart from the motor function, which it shares both on both sides, which is usually crossed, so it becomes more complicated to understand stroke. It's not so. This is a slide just to show that how the patient will have an acute stroke of the hospital region having a hemianopia. So in community, in society, in our practice, most common symptoms of the stroke or the signs of the stroke are these three things. If the patient has a sudden facial droop, sudden difficulty in lifting the arm or abnormal speech, if any of these symptoms are out of the three, any of these three are present, we are almost right. 72% of the chances it is an acute stroke. If facial deviation plus arm grip is there, we are almost sure, almost 95% it can be stroke. So more because the area controlling the face and the arm are very closely located in the brain and supplied by the same artery. So same things, it's always the acute stroke happens very suddenly. So it is like an attack. So it is a drain attack. 
it is a life threatening emergency so we should not be wasting time we should refer we should treat the patient we should get the imaging as early as possible so some of this i had already mentioned 15% of the stroke can be due to the bleeding inside the brain so if you imagine any bleeding inside the brain raises the pressure inside the skull so there will be some signs of raised icity when there is a bleeding so if hemorrhagic strokes in addition to all these will have acute onset headaches severe vomiting sometimes the patient will go for a brief unconsciousness so these are all due to raised icp the same thing i am repeating we should understand we should recognize all these symptoms in our clinical practice so now we have technology which is helping us there are some stroke mimics established stroke mimics like seizure migraine tumor transient global amnesia which are very rare to present like a stroke so though we will see in the practice so if we add an mri which is very commonly easily available in our part of the country if we add an mri brain, if we have any doubt if it is a, whether it is a stroke or a stroke mimic if you add an mri we can all we are almost sure 99% we won't miss the diagnosis mri is very sensitive for any stroke within the early 10 minutes of the onset so this i would go into this complex this is a grading of the stroke to understand the severity If it is more than 10 in that score scale, we know it is a large stroke. It is one of the large vessel is occluded. We have IV, I mean sorry, we have app, mobile apps to do that. So in last 25 years, what has changed? Before that, before 1995, the standard of care was aspirin and rehabilitation. but there was there was an understanding there is a concept of penumbra like in heart if there is no occlusion of the heart occlusion of the artery supplying the myocardium there will be sudden impact there will be sudden stunning of the heart which can be reversed if we reestablish flow to that artery same thing was uh, extrapolated in brain also the, that was the concept of penumbra so if you have an occlusion of an artery this whole area of the brain is at risk but in the process to salvage the brain the our natural tendency there are some collateral supply to establish flow but this won't be sustained for long unless we reestablish the flow that is the concept of penumbra at the onset there will be core tissue of dead tissue in the center more than 80% will be salvageable so that is the penumbra so at the onset it will be a small penumbra 80 85% is salvageable if you don't do anything it will slowly progress over 6 hours it is more than 50% And if we don't re-establish the flow, the whole of the tract will be compromised because the collateral circulation will will not sustain this for more than six hours. So th this was the rationale for thrombolysis. So in 1996, IV RTP, a recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, was approved for dissolving the clot causing the stroke within three hours of onset. So stroke care is a team work. Actually, when we are practicing. in the part of the country the first point of contact is the most important person you should understand it is a stroke and if you have a ct facility just do a ct as early as possible rule out the bleed and find out whether the patient is a candidate for iv thrombolytic therapy then if you feel it is a severe stroke or you are said that need doesn't have the uh, uh, facilities to treat a large vessel stroke you can start the iv rtp and you can actually within next 45 minutes to 1 hour you can shift to the higher center for further care so initial steps are confirm the time of onset the patient comes within the iv window that is 4 and 1/2 hours we have to act very fast grade the severe thing very easy head to toe examination uh, push the patient for a ct brain if iv axis always take on the normal side of the body not on the paralyzed side 18 gauge needle because if you are doing a ct contrast 18 gauge is needed the only investigation bed side we need is a random blood sugar and ecg is not mandatory clinically there is no urethral in the pulse rate and checklist for contraindication though the checklist looks very huge only blood sugar random blood sugar less than 50 is a contraindication and the ct any blood inside the ct in the brain in ct is a absolute contraindication So this is a parenchymal bleed. This is a parenchymal bleed, subdural, extradural. <coughs> these are thin subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this is massive subarachnoid. These are all absolute contraindications for IV thrombolysis. And these are the subtle changes which 
in the case with a large vessel of blood, this is a thrombus in the middle cerebral artery, this is an established infarct, and these are the mild lendiform nucleus of stress. So when I have already told when to do MRI, when we are in a doubt whether this stroke in which MRI is the ideal investigational choice, when you are suspecting a brainstem stroke or a posterior circulation stroke, then MRI is more, more sensitive to diagnose. And if you are seeing a patient coming with a wake-up stroke and we are not sure about the time of onset, then MRI is a definite investigation. This is a gentleman who came early morning, 7 o'clock. His wife noticed that he is not moving uh, the left side of his body at around 6, 6.30. So MRI showed an established impact. He is not a good candidate for thrombolysis. So just the dosage, which is a very commonly available drug, 0.9 milligram per kilogram, 10% VQ over borders over 1 minute, and rest VQ is 1 hour of an infusion. <coughs> the only important bedside monitoring is we have to keep the systolic VP around and below 180 and diastolic VP below 105 for the next 24 hours. <coughs> Just going to large or large stroke, that is when we have a large NHS score, does it indicate a large vessel occlusion? Yes, most probably it is. Because when the NHS score is more than 10, we are dealing with large part of brain is compromised because of the ischemia. So why, what is the implication? When large clot size decreases the probability of recanalysis with IV artery. Suppose you imagine an internal carotid artery which is around 8 mm to 9 mm and middle cerebral artery which is around 4.5 mm and a basilar artery which is around 6 mm. So any clot which is occluding this will be definitely more than 8 mm. So they found out if the clot is more than 8 mm, the chances of this intravenous drug thrombolysis is very low. Because it is a thrombus, is a thromb complex thing made of fibrin, red cells and platelets. So there were a lot of studies trying to extend the window from 4 and a half hours, but all failed, only these two. The green thing was a successful. So the, the, currently the window is 4.5 hours, 4 and a half hours. So at the same time, cardiologists were making immense progress in the intervention field. They understood that recanalizing the thrombus you can easily establish by going near the clot and instilling the drug. The same thing was reciprocated with lot of studies. So going near the clot and with a small microcatheter giving the drug. So in 2009, uh, there was a good secondary period. It was a retrievable stent which was used for aneurysm coiling. They found out after coiling, they used to we used to take out the stent. So suppose there was a thrombus found due to that process, this stent will pull out the thrombus. So this thing was used for acute stroke also. So this was a game changer. So what you have to do is read the clot, put the stent, wait for two to three minutes. Usually that clot will get captured in the stent and we have to retrieve it. Same thing in the animation. So there were studies using this new generation device in the last 10 years. So it was all in 2015 when the guidelines changed because all these trials conducted in 2010 to 2015 was using this newer generation device and they found out very good success in large vessel occlusion. Still for small vessel occlusion, IV therapy is the standard of care. So these were the successful trials in 2015. So guidelines got updated in 2015 June. So now intervention endovascular therapy is also standard of care in large vessel occlusion with a high NIH score in patients above 18 years. So just to, I'll briefly go through this, but this is what we do. We do a drawing puncture, we treat the uh, culprit vessel, we take a micro catheter, this is the clot and there we instill the, if it is a small clot we give some indra arterial, if it is a large clot we take the stent and take out the clot. One patient with a MC occlusion, so here uh, we take the micro catheter and then we instill the clot, we instill the indra arterial agent, we could recognize the artery. Obese lady, she is a school teacher, 41 year old. She had large vessel occlusion, the basal artery is shortly occluded. We can see in the plain CT, this is the clot inside the basal artery. So, this is total cut up of the basal artery. She is comatose, G6 was 3. So, in this scenario, what we, we know, there is a long clot. We 
place the stem because these are the stem markers. Stem markers, we place it for two to three minutes. It will cancel the clot. This is a clot. Fortunately, we could replace the artery, and in one month, he was totally functioning. He was back to work. Similar, another gentleman, post CAPG, there is a left MC occlusion. Here also, we tried with the same thing. We tried with the Intra-arterial thrombolytic agent, but we understood there was a small nose here, small narrowing. So we, like the cardiologist, we do a small plastic with a two millimeter balloon. We could treat and like. He also had a good outcome. So these are newer devices. Like this, the cardiologist, we have some such an aspirate, like a vacuum thing. We can aspirate the thrombus also. It is very fast and it is less electromagnetic to the vessel because we are not crossing the thrombus. We are making keeping the microcatheter proximal to the clot and aspirating. This one patient we had around one year back, hot locus of the left ICA. You can see the ICA, there is a thrombus. So we do balloon plastic, we take the wire across, we the stem and we recalize the artery. But not all patients will have good outcome. This patient had a huge infarct and it has, actually we know it is going for a midline shift and patient was going more drowsy. So, in those scenarios, we, our neurosurgical colleagues do a decompressive craniotomy so that ICP is reduced. Similar thing, patient non anticoagulation suddenly had a stroke and the next day he had a big hemorrhagic conversion. So, we have to do an immediate decompression. So, decompressive craniotomy is also now established for very bad stroke. But this is not the right scenario because we have to treat the patient before this happens. So ideal IH protocol is for very high NHS score, we have to get a CT brain with an angio. For CT angio, the message is we should not wait for serum creatinine. We are justified in doing a CT angio in an acute stroke scenario without the creatinine report. Unless patient is an established kidney failure patient. So when to do mechanical thrombectomy? When we are having a stroke more than five hours, four and a half hours, up to eight hours, we can do mechanical. When there is contraindication for IBRTPA, like high INR level. So conclusion: uh, stroke is a medical emergency. IV thrombolysis is still the standard of care in ischemic stroke, and those with very high NHS, we can benefit from endovascular treatment. So just two more slides. One thing is TIAs, transient ischemic attacks or mini stroke, we should give the full credit because in the next 3 days to 30 days, they have around 25 to 30 percent chance of having a full blown stroke. So they are equivalent to angina in heart. So we have to just easiest investigation for a suspected TIAs, do an MRI brain with angiogram, neck and circular bilis, and a 2D echo. This will establish most of the time the possible. So I'll conclude saying that time is brain and it's our responsibility to educate the society. Thank you. Any advice, interventional procedure is the conclusion of the internal Yes, sir, within the eight hours window from the onset. Personally, the block is say, for 65 or any criteria like that. In an acute scenario, sir. Not an acute scenario. The patient presented with yeah, PAA, the yeah. then was investigated, there is 65% of block in ICU. Do you advise something for that individual? Yes, sir. The um, guidelines is 2011 guidelines, what we follow is if the ipsilateral side, the side which is involved is more than 50% in a CT angiogram or 70% in a carotid doctor. So if there is a suspicion, it's is a borderline 65 percent, we have to get a CT angiogram. So that is more sensitive in uh, quantifying the problem. So 50 percent is a cutoff in CT angiogram. Thank you. I have a request, uh, Dr. Paramahala, President, to have a reciting and representation to Dr. Vitish Naeem.